Hey, I'm Jim Johnson, your host here with Contractor Radio, and I want to thank you for taking the time today to listen to our show. And our show is all about you, helping you get control of your business so you can grow your business and find that personal and financial freedom you're after. So hang on tight, episode's about to start. Hey everybody, it is Jim Johnson here, your host with Contractor Radio with another episode. And this one's going to be awesome. I've been kind of waiting on this one to get this done. We've had to reschedule a couple of times. We both had conflicts with our schedule. And uh, when it comes to solar, I've talked to a lot of people that act like they kind of know solar and what's going on. Uh, this is the first guy where both sides of the equation. The sales side of it, yes, very good. A lot of people can sell this stuff, but the install and how to run it in a business and those type of things, it was super interesting. I mean, shoot, he came out with a drone with a FLIR camera on it. And so uh, we're going to have a guy here that understands both sides of the coin of solar. Hopefully, we're going to talk a little bit about what some of the struggles were, maybe some of the things that contractors should be aware of whenever it comes to getting into solar, especially roofing contractors, because it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, super excited about this. Um, and, and I'm not going to wait any longer. Like we might as well just get him in here. This is the vice president of American Home Contractors and the brand manager for Infinity Home Solutions, one of the brand managers. There's several of them because we're going we're to talk about some private equity, too. We can't miss that. Hey, David Silverstein, uh, good to see you again, brother. Hey, nice to see you, Jim. Thanks yeah, for having it was, me. Yeah, it was awesome. I got to hang out with you. We went out and put on some solar shingles, the powerhouse product from Dow. And uh, you were doing your investigative like research stuff. And I, I was, I have to be honest with you, I was a little bit cautious. Like, I don't know if we have everything where we need it to be just yet, but uh, you were patient with us. You were interested in it. You actually helped us a lot in kind of understanding what we need to offer when it comes to those powerhouse shingles. And so I just want to say thanks for coming out and hanging out with us. Oh yeah. It was a blast. Thanks for having me. And the weather was actually warm out in Minnesota. So yeah, it wasn't too right. bad. Like we, we didn't have parkas on and ski outfits and stuff like that. It was, it was tolerable for that time of year. It is not so much that way right now. I think it was minus 20 this morning there. So oh. like, yeah, there's man. a reason I moved away from that. So, um, vice president of American, vice president Home of American Home contractors. And, yep. and so, why don't you just give us kind of the background story of American home contractors and then to a little bit of that journey of like, hey, this private equity thing came up. And we wanted to be a part of Infinity Home uh, Services. Yep. And so so kind of walk us through just a little bit of that to let all the listeners know who you are and uh, why I want to talk to you so badly. Sure. So uh, my partner, Steve Lozinski, he founded the company in 1986 and started off as a window company, and then slowly entered into roofing in the 90s, and then in the 2000s, got involved with some storm work, kept doing uh, windows as well, siding, gutters, all the exteriors. Uh, in 2015, I sold my interest in a, a company that I owned, and I partnered up with Steve at American Home Contractors, and him and I continued growing the business, and in June of 2022, we actually sold the business to private equity. And that's how Infinity Home Services entered the group or entered the fold. And after we sold in June of 2022, we were the fifth acquisition. Uh, they acquired nine companies. The original private equity firm was North Branch Capital out of Chicago. After they acquired nine companies, they ended up selling us all. So we rolled to two larger private equity firms uh, Light Bay Capital and Freeman Spogley out of Los Angeles and New York. And now in 2024, now we are at 15 brands and we just made an acquisition in Canada. So we're technically international. Oh, wow. <laughs> so is, did you say 2017 is when you joined up with Steve? Uh, 2015, 2015. 2015. So yep. seven years later, we're like going to private equity and all that. What was it like whenever you first joined American Home Contractors? Was it was it a big operation, small opera? What, what did it look like? Uh, it was a smaller company. We were doing uh, about $3 million a year when I joined in 2015. 
And leading up to acquisition, we were closer to 20 million. So, we so all because of you, quickly. right? right? Well, no, right. no, it was, it was a great team, right? <laughs> you know, I, you know, I guess I was a spark plug and a catalyst, but no, it's it's really the team that that helped us get there. But you know, hiring great people, bringing great great people as part of the company, you know, allowed us to continue growing. And you know, we had a lot of growing pains. You know, when you're trying to grow that fast, you know, if you make any mishires, it's definitely a, a you know a step back. But taking one step back, take two steps forward. Um, you know, adding the right people. Now we have uh, some of the most tremendous talent in the industry as part of our company, which is why we're so successful with Tesla Solar Roof and some of the other products that we're selling currently. It takes the best team to do that. <laughs> yeah, it, tell me about it because um, I get to coach a lot of contractors, uh, roofers in particular, and uh, it seems like there's a group of folks out there that are constantly after roofers to install solar. Like they seem so like they go together so well that a roofer should be able to do solar. And is, were you guys kind of approached that way whenever you first started to get into this solar thing, or did you do it a different way where you just said, Hey, we're going to get it solar. We weren't really approached by anybody. Uh, so GAF energy approached us in 2017 with their product, the DecoTech system, which was the integrated panel system, right? Just solar panels with, with a proprietary frame that gets flashed into the roof, just like a skylight would. Uh, they approached us in 2017 to get certified. So we ended up getting certified with GAF Energy to install the DecoTech product. And then in 2018, our market got hit by a windstorm. And it was a severe windstorm. So, you know, every roofing contractor in our market in the D.C. metro Maryland, Virginia, D.C., Pennsylvania areas were busy uh, because of that windstorm that came through. So we didn't have any time, uh, any bandwidth to focus on anything else except for taking care of all those people that had wind damage and issues with their roofs from that storm. So 2018 was a storm year, big surge year. Uh, we grew tremendously that year, tried to scale up as quickly as possible. We were trying to hire as many crews as possible, but, you know, it there was a, definitely a labor problem that year across the board for roofing contractors in our market. Uh, so we kind of took a, a break from it in 2018. In 2019, we started the conversations again. And towards the end of 2019, I actually had the DecoTech product installed on my house. And that was the first time when I bought my Tesla Model 3. So I got an electric vehicle and I started my journey towards renewables. So I had the solar system and I also got a Powerwall battery installed as well. So GAF DecoTech solar system on my house, a Powerwall battery, Tesla Powerwall battery, and then the Tesla Model 3 electric vehicle. So that was at the end of 2019. And then in 2020, we got connected with Tesla for installing the Tesla solar roof product. So just straight from a manufacturer, it's, it's kind of different than what I see with most people. It's some solar machine out there that, you know, they tend to do the door knocking. They are what you call an EPC company, engineering procurement and construction, I think is what that stands for. And what they need is a bunch of little sales teams out there to sell uh, products so they can go and do what they do. And they tend to make it sound easier than what it really is. And it seems like a lot of false promises and that kind of thing. And I'm not trying to lump everybody. I'm sure there's a good EPC company out there. I just haven't found one. Uh, that tends to work for any longevity. It might work for a short period of time, but it's, it doesn't last real long. Did you ever get approached by any of those folks at all? We did, but we view it as, you know, you can't just sell a product. You need to actually understand the product from the technical perspective. So when I got into the industry, I got into the roofing industry in 2002 after I graduated high school and I got into it through the installation side. A buddy of mine convinced me to hop on the roof with him that summer, do some side work, make some cash money. And I fell in love with it, you know, and then I actually worked full time when I went into college that fall um, doing school, working full time roofing. But I came in through, like I said, the installation side. So I was very familiar with roofing, how to diagnose leaks, how to install shingles, how to install wood shakes, learning all the various products. So we kind of took that approach with solar as well. I wanted to install the products on my house. So I knew firsthand how the products go together. I understood all the nuance, what could go wrong, right? From a service perspective. Um, and then that translates into sales. You know, once you fully understand the product then you can sell the product better. And now I actually have the Tesla solar roof on my house and I have the DecoTech system on my shed. I'd moved it over from the house to the shed. 
And again, just living with that product, going through the app, seeing how it works, seeing how the production, the consumption, the charging, the discharging, all that behavior kind of plays out in the app. Um, it, 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 it creates for a better understanding of the product since I'm living with it and I can sell it so much better and I can articulate that to homeowners. You know, and when we install a Tesla solar roof for somebody, they have a lot of questions. So I'm able to provide a lot of answers because I've lived through it. I lived through the, you know, the sales process, the design, the permitting, the interconnecting, um, you know, the installation and then post-sale you know, commissioning the system, going through the app, figuring out how things work, how the features, you know, what to look for, um, diagnosing problems. You know, I had a couple issues come up, you know, it's, it happens. Uh, one of which was the utility company was actually sending high voltage to our house. So it was actually arc faulting our inverter and causing our solar system to malfunction, Jeez. which wasn't a, it wasn't even a problem of Tesla's or, or ours, but you know, nonetheless, it was a problem. So just living through those experiences, I'm, I'm much more aware of what can happen and what can go wrong. So yeah, we're a big believer in, you know, being very involved with the products and that's why I installed them in my house and I live with them every single day, which, you know, helps me out with explaining it. Is, is that a practice that you guys apply to like your production managers and, and people in production? Like, Hey, you need to install some of this stuff. You need to see what it is and how it works and all that. Do you, do you actually incorporate that into your business too? Uh, a lot of our team eats the dog food. Yeah. I mean, a lot of our team <laughs> that own houses, they'll have products and services that we provide installed on their own houses, whether it's windows, roofing, siding, gutters, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, a couple of people in the company own Tesla vehicles, so they're becoming more familiar with Tesla as a brand and as a company. And then, you know, from a, from the solar standpoint, we have more. One of our main installers had solar installed on his house, so yeah, it just helps when you know you're passionate enough about the product to actually install it on on your own roof. And that's that's a testament. You know, we, we want to provide the best products and services, and if they truly are the best, then we would want them on our own properties as well. So I, I think the question for me, because you said you have the car, you have now two roofs, you have a power wall. Is there a personal side of that that, you know, sustainability, alternative energy? Is, it, is there something there at your core that you're going, hey, I think this is the way things are going or you see some value in it? What, explain a little bit of where that all comes from. Uh, so, yeah, I do think that I mean, it's to me, it's pretty obvious at this point. Everything's being electrified. Cars are being electrified. Heating is being electrified through electric heat pumps and geothermal. Um, you know, so I see everything moving that way. So, yeah, I mean, to me, the, the writing was on the wall. So it was just a matter of when. What kind of early adopter are you? I didn't get Tesla's, you know, a Tesla back in 2016, but I waited till 2019 when I felt the technology was built out enough. I was comfortable enough. I had the budget for it. So that's when I made the leap. And once you go to an electric vehicle, there's a lot of considerations you have to have, like, how am I going to charge this vehicle at home? You got to get an electric vehicle charger. And then, of course, you know, from a moral standpoint, you don't want to be charging your car from the dirty grid. You want to be charging it from clean solar on your house. So most people that go electric vehicle will eventually go solar if their house is a good fit for it and then couple it with the battery so that you can go off grid and you become sustainable. So yeah, it was a uh, energy independence. I say was a driving factor. It wasn't. It wasn't as much green. You know, I do believe in that, but um, energy independence, I think, is you know extremely important. And no matter where your politics lie, you know, I think it's a good idea to be less dependent on the utility company and the grid um, moving forward, for sure. Yeah, I would be one of those people um, here in Texas a couple of years ago. Everybody like. Even if you lived in the Northeast, you know, we had what we call snowmageddon, like everything shut down. We had no electricity. Uh, my house in particular is a very frustrating thing because it has one heat source. That's it. And it's electrified. So um, I started looking into alternatives as well. I wasn't happy with a lot of the stuff that was out there. I sure didn't want to have rack and panel in my house. I know there's, you know, pros and cons to everything, but I just didn't like the look of it. I didn't like the mechanism of it. Like there's, it's another thing on top of my roof instead of being part of my roof. And so I started looking at different solar options and, and really the payback part of it wasn't as important to me as I thought it was going to be. I wanted this like 100% offset thing, but that's not always feasible based on your home and that kind of thing. I think ours is going to be about 80, 85% offset is what we can get. 
that's clean energy. Uh, like you use the words dirty and clean. And since you and I met, um, we, we did go out and get an electric vehicle. Uh, we, we went and got the uh, Mustang Mach-E GT. Oh, my God. Oh, very cool. Yeah, that thing is awesome. <laughs> it is lightning fast. It had a setting on it called Unbridled, and uh, it is unbridled. It's, it's pretty cool. But now that's like, okay, I got the electric car, and now I'm going to charge this thing. I went through the same thought process you did. Like, well, I'm just pumped. Like, I got this vehicle to be as um, conscious of the environment as I possibly can be. And now I'm over here, like, pulling energy from burning coal and whatever else is uh, generating our uh, our grid energy. So that's my next step. I'm putting solar shingles on my own home, integrated into the system. I like the way that works. I like a lot of the technology there. I like the ease of it and the fact that a roofer can do it. Did those play into the factors of why you guys chose to go with the JF and Tesla? Is, is it was more like being a roofer? Now, I know, I believe you do rack and panel too, right? Uh, we just got involved in that as well, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because those options are options, right? And there's there's price comparison differences. There's the amount of power that a panel can generate versus a shingle. All those things come into consideration that maybe it's right for this home and not for that home. And the more people you can qualify for it, the more chance you have of providing them with a product or service that, that fits. Is that why you guys have stepped into the rack and panel side of things too? So we started from the roofing side because as roofers, we – we're very much opposed to people penetrating a brand new roof with the rack systems, the solar panel rack systems. Yeah, we you know. no roofer likes to see another hole in the roof. <laughs> no. And, you know, back in the day when, you know, solar companies were trying to sign people up on lease agreements and just trying to gain mass adoption, uh, they were installing a lot of solar panels on beat up roofs that needed to be replaced. And they just weren't very careful in the installation practices. So a lot of them ended up leaking. So they, it made a bad name for the industry, really. You know, and a lot of roofers started hating solar panel companies because they were just damaging roofs left and right. And they were installing product on roofs that needed to be replaced either immediately or shortly thereafter. So our, you know, our our thought process is we don't want to install solar on a roof that's going to need to be replaced within, you know, five or 10 years. So, you know, once you go to replace your roof, the best time to think about solar is during that that, that process, you know, so you're replacing your roof, you're going solar. If you can go with an integrated product, like a solar roof, that's great. You know, it just depends on orientation. It depends on, um, shading. It depends on your, um, your budget it depends on your layout of the roof, the mounting planes, right. And the various products like GIS product is installed in a rectangular array. So you got to have the right roof space for it. Same with solar panels. The Tesla solar roof product, the smaller tiles, they can stagger around obstructions. They can stagger up valleys, down hips. Um, you know, it's it's uh, very versatile. You know, it can go around a lot of different things. And on certain roofs that are really cut up, you can actually get more production out of the Tesla solar roof than traditional panels. Not to mention when you put traditional panels, like you said, on a very cut up roof, aesthetically, it doesn't look great. You know, and yeah. I think most people would agree with that statement. You know, but when you have a beautifully integrated product like Tesla Solar Roof, you can't tell where the solar begins and stops because it's all integrated into one roofing system and it's just beautiful. You know, when people walk by and see the house, they don't know what they're looking at, really. They're like looking at, is that a slate roof? Is that, it looks like glass. What is that? And I tell <laughs> them that's that's a solar roof. You know, it actually produces clean electricity. So, yeah, we came in through the roofing lens of we don't want to compromise the integrity of the roof. So we want to try to avoid panels as much as we can. And we want to go with a solar roofing option. But for certain roof types and certain budgets, the panels do make a lot of sense. Now, you got to make sure the roof is in good condition, right? You got to make sure that you're using good brackets and good fastening techniques so that you're not going to compromise the integrity of the roof, especially since it's going to be underneath of panels, um, but yeah, I mean, we would prefer, uh, an integrated solution like a solar roof as opposed to panels. It just depends on the budget, you know, cause panels are still more powerful per square foot than the GIF Timberline solar product. And even the Tesla solar roof product, even though that's much more comparable. Yeah. That, you know, it has a lot to do with why I chose to, uh, get in on the distribution of the powerhouse product. I was going to um, say, can we talk about that now? Is that a, yeah, that's not a secret, it, it, right? 
No, it's not a secret. Um, I, for those of you that don't know, um, I did uh, join in with a company called Plan A Solar. We have the sole distribution rights for powerhouse shingles, which were uh, created by Dow. They're manufactured by Revere uh, Plastics. And we're, we're pumped about this product because you heard um, uh, David mention like, and I'm not knocking anything. I want to be really clear about that. But GF has to be installed in a rectangle. So right roof, right situation, that works great. Um, and the Tesla is like the whole roof. And it's pretty expensive, to be honest with you. Like, if you really look at the expense of it. And what we liked about Powerhouse is it was able to be installed on angles, in triangles. You could cover a lot more roof surface space with it um, and be a little bit more budget friendly. It's not I will be the first one to say, it doesn't look like a Tesla roof. Tesla roofs are beautiful. I'm going to give them a lot of credit. But to be into a integrated solar shingle system versus a rack and panel and being approximately the same cost, I'd rather have that integrated shingle than I would the uh, the panel system. Now, you had a chance to come look at it. What did you think? I th it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah, that's the what installation I was simple. Looks great. Yeah. 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 It installs great. It's, uh, it's Yeah. I'm looking forward to getting it uh, in our market as soon as we can get the pricing and as soon as we can get, you know, distribution figured out and access to the product, get a few sales under our belt. Yeah, we would definitely want to make that a, a product mix for our 2024 goals for sure. Well, that's kind of what we saw. We, it filled a gap, right? It filled a gap between the expense of a Tesla roof, kind of this not so pretty um, uh, rack and panel system. And yeah, there's some competitors out there, but we have this flexibility of where the system goes and how it gets installed versus being in a rectangular shape. So there's a there was a gap there. And anytime I see a gap in something that I think, hey, we could probably do it better than, um, I would like to go ahead and pursue that. So we have, we're getting everything ready. Distribution is pretty much squared away. We got that part kind of figured out. Um, really the the manufacturer and how much of it. Um, we, have, we have a whole community that 750 houses that is going to install the whole entire thing in uh, powerhouse shingle because they couldn't get it done with other choices that they had, which is pretty cool to see. Um, Jim, are you coupling that with uh, batteries on any I, of the installations? And one of the very cool things about it is it didn't, it doesn't matter what kind of battery it doesn't, have, you could use a Tesla battery if you want to, which I think Tesla's is probably the highest, most premium version of your power wall type setups. Um, but, uh, we're looking at a lot of different options on that. There's uh, one by Lion that's really pretty slick. Uh, so yeah, we're we can distribute all of the products that go along with a solar install, whether that be your gateway systems, your batteries, uh, solar shingles. Uh, we're going to stick with that one product because we believe in it that much. But um, it'll it'll combine with any of your other choices out there. That's great. Now, yeah, I feel like I just got interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. You you got to put your eyes on on a complete system out there, um, and he had a pretty high end high tech system. You 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 flew a drone over it with a FLIR camera. What, what were your assessments of that? I thought that was pretty cool. I didn't even know that was a thing, and uh, you you showed us how that worked. That was that was pretty cool. Yeah, the infrared drones are really cool. Um, you know, just to check out the the production, make sure that there's no no discolorations you know, in the system, everything should be a similar color. When you're looking at the different solar shingles and the arrays and the strings, they should all be lit up the same color. So if something's uh, a different color, or you can see some imperfections in the individual shingles or tiles, then you know, something could be going on. It could be, you know, a diode, it could be the shingle itself. Um, you know, if a whole strings out, it could be just a connection with the inverter or a communication issue. So it's really nice from a maintenance standpoint and, you know, peace of mind, you know, when you go to commission the system, if you fly that infrared drone over top of the house, you can see and verify everything is being done correctly and being lit up at the end of the, the project. And then moving forward, if the homeowner has any questions about, hey, my, I think my production's a little off or they have a hailstorm or something happens that could question the, the integrity of the roof, then you can just take your drone out there. You can fly it over top. You can do the infrared imagery and you can be able to determine if something may be going on or not. You know, we, we actually had an incident where a homeowner's uh, daughter shot a crossbow up in the air and it went <laughs> straight up, straight down and actually broke one of the tiles. 
And, you know, he didn't notice it for like a month or so. And he realized, hey, you know, something's a little, little off. So he looked out on his roof. He, he saw the tile, looked a little damaged, took some photos, sent it to us. I went over, I flew the infrared drone and I picked up on some hot spots on that tile. And I'm like, yeah, that, that, that arrow actually damaged the tile. It actually broke the tile. So we had to swap that tile out. And then afterwards, everything was, was operating fine. But yeah, the infrared drone definitely helps out. And people use those infrared drones on like solar fields. You know, instead of sending electricians out there with electrical equipment to test things, you could just fly a drone out there. And as long as the arrays and the, the panels and everything, the colors are all, all consistent, then you can assume that things are working properly. And was, was that a Tesla or a GAF roof? It was a Tesla roof. Okay. So how simple, because I don't know, this is a genuine question. How simple is it to take a panel out and put another one in? Pretty simple? Pretty simple. Yeah. It's just a matter of getting on the roof. And, you know, since it's a glass roof, it can be challenging to walk on, depending on the weather outside. And, you know, if it's a, in the early morning or it's dewy out. But getting on the roof carefully, got to use ropes, obviously. But, yeah, getting up on the roof, swapping out tiles, doing minor maintenance and repairs is, is not a big deal. I hate interrupting these videos, but this thing is something that every contractor should have. It's company cam. It is the one piece of software every home service contractor should use to document their jobs. Every picture you ever take is associated to the address you took it. It's like Instagram for every project that you have. Give a link to the homeowner and share it to them while you're doing your inspection and win more sales. If you want to find out more about company cam, check the description below. Save a few bucks by following our link. I do not have them here. I wish I did. Um, the day that I flew out to come and uh, to to meet you up there, I left, and 15 minutes later, the roofing boots showed up. These ones that I uh, was going to test for somebody. I remember that. I remember you telling me that. <laughs> they are great. Uh, they they work they work awesome on asphalt, but they're amazing on metal, glass, all of it. Um, I was, I was really like, okay, these things are the real deal. I wouldn't say they're quite like, Hey, I'm going to go on a 12, 12, like I would with a cougar paw and just be, you know, sans ropes, but, uh, I would never do that. But, um, they were great. I was on a 10, 10 walking cross plane and no issues at all. Um, well, oddly or, enough, the, the Cooper Pauls, they don't really work great on the Tesla solar roof product or even the solar shingles from GAF either. They're actually oh, not yeah, that's like, that's like asking yourself to go off the roof if you're wearing something like that. Yeah, yeah, they're slick. They hold on great to asphalt and some, you know, metal or, or you know, some other uh, roofing materials, but not glass. These are like little rubber suction cups on the back of your, on the bottom of your boots. They're really good. You should check them out. I'll send you the link whenever we get at. Please do. I'll add, it, I'll add it in the show notes too. I always like to give them a plug. Uh, <laughs> they're the guys out of uh, uh, Scandinavia, so Denmark, I think. And uh, he created these boots for his own thing, and they've kind of taken off. So it's been pretty cool. Well, please do. We're always looking for uh, ways to be safer up there on these uh, solar roofing products. And we've we found that like skate shoes and basketball shoes, you know, flat soles tend to be the the best. So everybody, products everybody's there. out there wearing Vans, huh? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Vans, <laughs> Under Armour basketball uh, shoes. You know, those types uh, of racquetball racquetball court, like the rubber sole, the kind mm -hmm. of brown colored. Um, those work really great. Those are good products. Um, what are some of the mistakes that you think are common from roofing companies that get into solar that you guys may have made that you're like, hey, you should maybe pay attention to these two or three things. Like they could really save you a bunch of time. So I do think that roofing contractors have to do the work. They have to understand the products, do the research, and make sure that their team internally can install the products. They're not just selling it. Like you, like you referenced earlier, if you're just a sales organization and you don't have the technical know-how to install the products or maintain and service the products, then you can get into trouble because you're relying, you know, on that subcontractor or that third party to, you know, service the product and, and tell you what's going on. Like you need to know. Yeah, and make you look good or bad. <laughs> exactly. You need to know exactly what's going on because there's a lot of parts and components, you know, you're introducing electricity, to a roof, right? There's a lot of things that can go wrong, fire hazards, all that. So roofing contractors are really good at weatherization. Solar companies are good at making connections and installing solar. 
So you got to blend the two. So some of the mistakes early on that we made were, you know, I guess moving a little bit too quick when we should have paused and we should have done a little bit more research and made sure that we understood things a little bit more. But that's why that we installed it on our on our own houses so that we could be living with the product and we could see firsthand how it works and what's going on with it and monitoring it and seeing, you know, throughout the seasons, you know, because the sun travels through the sky and it's lower in the winter and higher in the summer. So we have all sorts of questions from folks and we put together frequently asked questions on our YouTube channel to help address some of these major, major topics that people have questions on. But, um, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to understand why things are the way they are. Why is the production this way in October and it's different in June while the sun's higher in June than it is in October? You know, the, the leaves are still in the trees in October and the sun's low. So you're getting, you know, it's a lot of shading. So, you know what I mean? Like we just make sure you understand the product before you dive into it. And then also making sure you're ready for the investment. You know, when you're going into solar, it's not just a, you know, snap of the fingers. You know, you got to make sure you do the online training and then try to get the electrical in-house as soon as possible. So Ooh, GAF has, yeah, GAF Energy, they have electrical services that they're providing the contractors. But again, it's, you know, they understand how it works. The contractor doesn't really understand what works. So anytime the homeowner has a question, they just push it over to GAF. Go, I don't know. I don't know what they're talking about. That's electrical. That's not roofing. So you got to understand the electrical. You got to understand the solar and obviously the roofing. Um And then once you can bring the electrical in-house, you got to hire a master electrician, which is a lot of investment, a lot of time, a lot of money in in the form of salaries. You got to get the (laughs) licensing in the different jurisdictions that you are offering your products and services. But once we we brought the electrical in-house, that's when it was truly a game changer because then we were less dependent on third parties. And again, we understood and we could control the electrical portion of the overall solar roof project because... Once you install the roof, that's only part of the process. Then you have to actually connect everything to the inverter, to the gateways, to the batteries. You can also do value-add products like electric vehicle chargers, smart electrical panel upgrades like Span.io. So you can bolt on a lot of different things once you have the electrical in-house and you're not beholden to some third party or some electrical partner that you have in the marketplace and working around their schedule. Because ideally, you want to do the roof and you want to have the electricians either on site while the roof is being completed or shortly after. Right. Yeah. (laughs) I don't have anything. Like, those are the things that I I saw as I watched contractors try to do this. And and my advice uh, for the last, I don't know, five, six years is more and more contractors have gotten into solar and asking me about it as a coach. I'm like, you got to bring it in house. You got to know it inside and out, backwards and forwards with your own crews, your own electrician, like all of that stuff. And it, and it's worth it. Don't get me wrong. It's like anything else. It's worth it. I bet you found out that you were more profitable, even though you had that big salary for that electrician, you were more profitable doing that than leaning on somebody else by a long shot. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it pays for itself. You've got to be committed. And early on, you know, on the front end, you know, you really got to focus on content and awareness. You got to put together a library of content so that when folks have questions, you can just send them a YouTube link and say, hey, here's some frequently asked questions. This will probably address some of your main concerns or things that you're thinking about. And then give us a call or talk to us if there's any anything you want to dive a little bit deeper on. Also, when you're designing systems, you got to be prepared to, you know, under promise and over deliver. Don't promise that you can fit a certain system size if, you know, you're coming up on the the fire setbacks or the maximum amount of square footage of that roof, you know, and certainly don't over promise uh, production capabilities because, you know, with a solar roofing product, it's a little bit different than panels. Panels are typically installed on the southern facing slopes, the mounting planes. Solar roofing, a lot of times you install it on all the different mounting planes. You may exclude, you know, certain smaller sections or certain, you know, sections that are facing due north, but, you know, northeast sections, southwest sections, east, you know, you can install the solar tiles everywhere, solar shingles everywhere. And it's beautiful because it's like nicely integrated and it just helps with the overall production throughout the course of the year when the sun is just going through the sky. And again, it's lower in the, in the winter, and it's hitting that south face a little bit hard. And then in the summertime, it'll hit those north facing slopes a little bit harder. So you can have a nice little mix, but you don't want to overpromise consumption or production. Um, and then also, 
you know, the interconnection and the permitting process. So the authority having jurisdictions, you know, the permit offices, they're slow. A lot of them are slow. A lot of them are tough to work with, especially with a new product like Solar Roof. They don't really understand the product, so it's foreign to them. You have to teach them. You have to work with them. You have to form good partnerships and relationships with them. And same with the utility companies. You know, and you can't expect things to go through that process quickly. So I guess uh, realistic expectations on the timeframes as well is what one major mistake we did early on. Mm. Um, and then also, you know, I'm just kind of thinking about all the shit that happened with us and you know, all the mistakes we made. Um, but <laughs> early on, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want everyone to succeed with this product. It's tough. You know, what we're trying to do is inherently difficult. So if any contractor out there needs assistance, I would encourage them to reach out to us so that we can help them along the way and speed up the process and get them up and running a lot quicker. We've actually installed um, Tesla Solar Roof for other certified installers and in other markets that aren't our core markets just to help them, you know, get off the ground running. But, See, that's the way it should be right there. That's the way yeah. it should be. Well done. Well done. Good job. Yeah, thank you. We're trying and to. I want to, I want to plug your YouTube, YouTube channel too, because you've mentioned it a couple times. It's American Home Contractors YouTube channel, right? Like just look up American Home Contractors and you got it. I'll send you the link. Yeah. Perfect. We'll put it in the show notes. That'll be great. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. So like early on when you're doing the uh, system designs, you know, again, just making sure the expectations are there, knowing that the permitting and the interconnecting process with the utility companies is going to be slow, much slower than you anticipate. Trust me when I say that. Um, and then also the deposits. So historically for our exterior products, we only, we only take a hundred dollars up front and then balance upon completion. You can't do that with these products. You got to make sure you you know, take a little bit more up front, not hopefully not from a cash flow perspective, but just to make sure the homeowner is invested enough and they have enough skin in the game. Because, you know, if they only have $100 down and it gets the project gets snagged and permitting or interconnecting and the homeowner just, you know, loses interest, you know, why am I spending 40 grand with this product? I can just buy a new car. Screw this. I'm going to cancel my project <laughs> and they'll yeah. do that. But if they have, you know, $1,500 or $10,000 down, then it's more of a commitment. And you can kind of right. weed out the folks who are just kicking tires compared to people that are actually serious. And then, you know, one thing that uh, solar companies historically do for free are designs. And we'll do a fair amount of designs for free, but we like to charge for them as well because it tells us who's serious enough about doing this project and who's just curious. Because when you get an est a ballpark estimate, you can go online and, and get, run through a cost calculator and get some numbers, right? That's not too difficult these days. But if you're asking the asking somebody to do a design for your home and specific to your home, your custom house, then there's a lot of time and energy that goes into that. And somebody has to do that. And usually takes at least an hour worth of somebody's time. So you should be charging for that. You know, you should be passing that value on to the homeowner. And the homeowner, if they're serious enough about the project, shouldn't have a problem paying for that. And, you know, hopefully you can apply that money towards the deposit of the project. So it goes into it and they feel like they're investing into it along the way. I'm coaching. Right. Okay, good. Yeah. We should charge for every one of those because it is time and it is intensive and there's some accuracy to it. That's super important to actually being able to determine the output of one of these systems versus just the kind of the online tool version of it. Uh, that it's a big difference. It's enough of a difference that I'd be willing to pay 149 bucks for, you know, some design work to see what it would look like on my roof first. Exactly. Yeah. Man, this was like all of those were like, bam, 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 bam. These are great piece of advice. This is one of those ones that uh, anybody that's looking at getting into it. I think there was a bit of fear there, too. Like you talked about fire setbacks and, and these things that roofers don't talk about a whole lot. Um, and so it probably made a few people nervous. I bet you there's a few people that even like turned off their solar thing. Those are the type of things where I go, OK, that sounded a little harder than I thought it was. It's not going to stop me. That just reduced my competition. My competition just became less. They're not mm -hmm. willing to investigate the time, the energy, the effort to do it right and get it perfected. That's going to give me a step ahead of everybody else. I like things that are harder. I like specialty roofing products. and that kind of, If it was harder, I wanted to do it because it would reduce my amount of competition. Do you guys use that as a bit of your strategy too? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we're one of a few Tesla certified installers doing solar roof at scale. Um, in the U.S. So there's only a few of us out there and we're leading the way. And it's nice to not have so much competition right now as we figure things out. But yeah, we embrace the fact that, 
you know, people can look to us and say, hey, I want a Tesla solar roof installed on a 5212 roof, you know, on the coastline. <laughs> and our team can actually do that where a lot of people would turn that down and be like, no way, that's way too hard. And, you know, there's only a handful of people, like I said, in the country, in the world that could pull that off. And we're one of the, fortunately, we're one of those companies. So yeah, we like taking on the projects that are too difficult, too complicated, too complex, because it just means nobody else wants them. And if the homeowner truly wants it, they'll be willing to pay a little bit of a premium. And, you know, you got to protect the margin, you know, roofers protect the margin. So, you know, we are first and foremost, a roofing company. We protect the margin. We're doing solar, but we're hopefully doing it the right way. We're making sure we're making money so that we can continue to service these systems and keep these relationships with the homeowners and manufacturers for years to come. Awesome. All right. I think we've covered solar pretty well, and I only have you for a few more minutes. So, um, private equity. You guys were too long, just fine. Everything is going good. You 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 decided to sell and be a part of this private equity in June of 2022. How long before that were you in conversations? Had other people approached you? What what were some of your um, key indicators to decide, yeah, we want to pursue this first off. And then if, once you pursued it, who you actually decided to go with? So we saw private equity entering the, the space, the industry, uh, I want to say like back in 2016. There were rumblings. I think 1-800-Hansons was bought. Window Nation was bought. So mm-hmm. I actually reached out to a couple of the private equity firms and I spoke to them. We were a much smaller company back then. And I you know, just, just asked them, hey, what are you looking for? What are your plans? What is this all about? Just trying to do my own research, not mm-hmm. relying on word of mouth from other people. And they flat out told me. They're like, we see the industry consolidating. And right now, we're trying to consolidate it with very large players, $50 million and up. So I was like, all right, well, we're not that big yet. And they basically said, all right, we'll keep in touch and we'll let you know how things are going. So we kind of kept our ear to the ground and kept kept following what was going on. And then we saw things really start to heat up um, pretty much back in like 2020, 2021. Things yeah. were really heating up. We were getting a lot of emails and we got a cold email out of nowhere that we followed up on. And we again, we were just doing our research. We were trying to figure out more information. We weren't necessarily looking to sell. We were just looking to understand. So we reached out on one of the cold emails, and we met Josh Sparks. We met um, TJ with North Branch Capital, the original private equity firm that bought us. And we loved them. You know, we loved their mission of saving communities from unscrupulous contractors. We loved the group they were putting together. And we loved just, you know, what they were all about. You know, they were putting together a bunch of brands in different markets, and it was a little bit different than um, some of the other roll-ups. Some of the other roll-ups were just buying as many companies as possible, and they were just going to, you know, bundle them together and then sell them to larger private equity firms, and then that, you know, was going to continue indefinitely, you know, supposedly. But we're actually putting together uh, a corporate structure. So we have Infinity Home Services has a corporate team. They have Josh Sparks as the CEO. They have a CFO, CMO, CHRO. They have corporate people doing marketing, finance, and just helping the other individual brands like American Home Contractors be successful. You know, they helped us last year grow 30% year over year. They helped our EBITDA um, almost double from when we were acquired to last year's results. Yeah, it's just because we're tapping into resources that we didn't have as an individual brand. You know, we were just a $20 million company in a market doing the best we could. You know, we had good relationships with manufacturers, distribution, contractor friends across the the country when we went to conferences, but we didn't have access to the resources we have now. And that's why we ultimately chose to partner with Infinity Home Services because of tapping into those resources and knowing that it was going to help take our business to the next level. And what was important for us when it came time to sell, you know, it was a great day to cash out and and get some roll up equity, right, from the financial side. But we were also able to take care of some of key key employees with some equity as well. And some of the key employees Mm -hmm. from other brands were able to join corporate. So they were able to advance their careers. And we told our team when we made the decision to sell, we're like, look, this is a positive for everybody because this will continue our growth trajectory and allow everybody to continue growing, developing. We have one-on-one meetings. We have, like I said, endless resources that we didn't once have. And we have 15 other brands across the country that we can tap into. 
You know, we can call them, we can have meetings, we can meet up in person and we can, you know, talk about struggles and, you know, best practices and all types of stuff. So it, the, the, the vast resources are, are incredible. So that's really like the, the positive about the group. Yeah, that's probably been the majority of my coaching for the last three or four years is this um, consolidation that's going on in our industry. And and I wish all of my clients would call me and like, let's talk about this as we roll forward. And it doesn't always happen. I wish it would. Um, because I've had this chance to kind of see all the different versions. I really like what Integrity Home Services is doing. I like that the contractor gets to keep his brand, gets to keep his culture. They're all headed on this um, protecting the homeowner or consumer from the unscrupulous contractors. But I think that fits with most high level um, raise the bar contractors. That's a, that's a good mission to have. And I like that they had this corporate team, which I don't see in a lot of the roll-ups. That's the, the corporate team that actually understands our industry. Uh, I've seen corporate teams, but they, they are thinking more like wall street and that kind of thing. they're not thinking like main street and mm -hmm. main street a bit of a different animal. Um, so yeah, I have two or three different, um, uh, consolidation groups that I, I have kind of leaned into going, Hey, these might be good choices for my clients. Um, some of the struggles that you have is, you know, incorporating one culture into another culture. And I, I'm pretty aware of my different clients culture and how that might fit with another out there. It is such a difficult thing to navigate because I think the biggest part that most contractors, you know, of any size smaller than 10 million, they're still trying to get their books straight and their systems and processes straight. Uh, and that's usually my coaching. I say fine tune it, get it perfected before you add anything else. So perfect your roofing thing, like nail that down if that's what you are as a roofer, nail it down, processes, systems, through recruiting, hiring, leadership, all that. It's nailed. Okay, great. I'll take on solar. So now you go perfect that thing. But now you're thinking, hey, consolidation, I better have my finances straight. That's number one. Like your finance better be tight. Uh, I've watched so many of these um, private equity and, and investment firms come in and get just completely like taken the other way around by a contractor that his, he assumed everything was great, but it wasn't. Have you guys seen that as you start to look into other brands out there and bring them into the equation, like their books and that kind of stuff being the, the biggest hurdle to cover? Yeah, especially up front. The biggest uh, hurdle is, you know, contractors thinking they're worth more than what they really are, thinking they're making a certain amount of money that they're not. <laughs> um, you know, like you said, getting your financial house in order, just making sure your books are really clean, making sure you understand the numbers, making sure you understand what EBITDA is, you know, pretty much the bottom line. Um, and making sure that you're, you're focused on protecting that, you know, our, our group will focus on, you know, $1 million and up for EBITDA. You know, that's, those are the companies we want to talk to, but some outfits will only focus on companies that are making three or $4 million worth of EBITDA and up you know, bigger companies, more profitable companies. Right. So, you know, it really comes down to the bottom line in our industry. We're not a technology company. We're not high growth. You know, we're not going to make up the, the difference once we grow to a certain scale. You know, these are service companies that are cash generating machines. You just got to make sure you're making good money, taking good care of customers, have a great reputation, and you'll be very attractive to private equity um, in the near future once you do those things. Yeah, I tend to have this coaching advice of, hey, I feel like I fill a gap between, you know, the solopreneur who's now decided he wants to grow and scale his business and this opportunity for consolidation that if we can work with them and get those systems and processes and books and all, you know, hiring uh, mechanisms and everything in place, then they become a lot more attractive to those private equity firms. I would assume that you guys had a lot of that in place before Integrity went, hey, guys, we're kind of interested in you. So we did, you know, we had, we were, we were making good money, um, but we definitely didn't have things as tight as, you know, we would have wanted them to be. And I think that's the same with most companies that go through the acquisition process. I mean, the due diligence, 
uh, after you sign the letter of intent, going through sending financials back and forth, org charts, payroll records, manuals, you know, all, you know, they just go inside and out of your business to make sure they understand who they're getting in bed with and who they're purchasing. Um, you know, in hindsight, yeah, you always want to make sure that things are a little bit tighter. You know, we had to put together, you know, some documents that we didn't have, you know, hey, right. like, you know, a formalized org chart. We had a rough org chart of, you know, who does what and who's reporting to who, but it wasn't like a, a formalized organization chart. So we had to put that together. Some of our manuals needed to be revised. They were a little bit outdated, although the best practices were in there. It was like, look, we got to tighten this up so that, it, you know, it just represents who we are and what we're actually doing these days instead of like, you know, a couple of years ago. Um so yeah, I mean, it was definitely a it was a learning learning experience, and uh, anyone who's gone through it can, you know, I'm sure attest to it. It's definitely not easy uh, once you sign that letter of intent, going uh, through the due diligence process um, up to settlement. You know, there's like five different stages. The first and foremost is finance, so you got to get the finance dialed in, and then after that, everything kind of clicks into place. You know. Such awesome advice. David, like I said before, we hopped on live here, um, the recording. Uh, you're one of those guys I just enjoy speaking with. Uh, I feel like I could sit there and talk with you for hours. Uh, it, some of the paths that you've walked, that our contractors want to walk, uh, your experience with solar, the fact that you're just a good human being. Like I enjoy the conversations with you. I wish I could talk more, but I, I'm at the end of my time limit today. If they want to get a hold of you, can they just... Um, is is it your email address? Well, how would you like say? Yeah, email? yeah, I can give you my email address for sure. I'll give you my email address. I'll give you the YouTube channel. Just put it in the show notes and yeah, Perfect. have anyone okay, reach great. out. Any of your uh, your fan base reach out. Happy to talk to them. I always enjoy talking to you as well, Jim. Yes, it's, it's I, <laughs> I learn something every time for sure, especially about the solar stuff. And I'm I'm still like I, I'm doing the same thing. Like anything I get into, I want to know it inside and out, backwards and forwards. So that whenever I do go and sell it, I'm not caught off. I like the first time you and I ever met, I got caught with my pants down. I'm like, okay, that'll never happen again. And so uh, it's been really good to uh, be in relationship with you. Hopefully it continues for uh, quite some time. I uh, appreciate having on on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Jim. All right, brother. Have a good one. We'll talk to you later. And uh, that is Contractor Radio. Appreciate it. See ya. Hey, everybody. That was David Silverstein. Uh, what an absolute awesome human being. And just uh, like all the struggles and everything they went through, like all these points that you need to you know, kind of have down about. So don't let it scare you. Let it encourage you. Let those challenges be those things that make you the exceptional contractor that you can be for your clients out there. Because when we know just a little bit more than everybody else knows out there, our chances and our opportunities get 10 x for us in our businesses. So don't shy away from the hard stuff. Do the hard stuff. You'll be surprised how well it pays off for you. Thanks for hanging out with us on another episode of Contractor Radio, and we'll see you next time. Oh, you're still here? Well, you must have thought it was great. Make sure to like and subscribe to Contractor Radio and never miss an episode because we're here to help you get better at what you do.